Before we get going with this week's show, a word from our friends at Woodbine. The great racing north of the border at Woodbine continues with two stakes on Friday, November the 18th. Both stakes are restricted to horses sired by stallions standing in Ontario. The Lake Ontario stakes on Friday is for three-year-old Colts and Geldings going a mile and a sixteenth on the synthetic, while the Ashbridges Bay stakes is the same for the three-year-old fillies. Then on Sunday, November the 20th, the Grade 2 Kennedy Road stakes matches three-year-old and up sprinters going six furlongs. Don't miss out on the action. For more information, go to www.woodbine.com. Those are our friends north of the border at Woodbine. Now, on to this week's show. What's happening? Welcome to the Matt Bernier Show, part of the In The Money Media Network. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bernier underscore Matt. Today is Monday, November the 14th, 2022. It's episode 139 of the pod. However you listen, thank you for doing so. You can find the pod in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and themoneypodcast.com. You can also watch and listen along over on YouTube. Search bar Matt Bernier Show. You will get this episode along with the 138 prior. And as always, please rate, review, subscribe, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. Make sure the bell icon is lit up. That way you get notified when new content is uploaded to the In The Money Media channel if you're over on YouTube. Uh, whether it's this show, the Players Podcast, anything else. Horse Players Happy Hour, which knock wood. Sounds like it might be back next year. It's got still got a little ways to go, but looking forward to that if we get to do it again. Um, but yeah, all that kind of stuff. Make sure that you are subscribed to all the feeds. So you get more and more content coming your way from the In The Money media family. Uh, first things first, thank you to everyone who left positive messages from last week's show, sent me emails completely unprompted um, as opposed to comments. Um, it, it means a great deal. And, you know, I think there's an element of, it sounds like everyone has gone through similar sorts of things. And um, I try to be as real as possible with this sort of thing. I don't want to put on any kind of a bullshit facade, you know, about where things are and, and this, that, or the other. So uh, last week was a, a good sort of, get it out, deep breath, and we move on. But there are things to be gleaned, I think, from Breeders' Cup weekend. And there were enough folks that thought that the idea of going back and me telling you what my sort of logic was and what the plays were during the Breeders' Cup betting challenge, there were enough that thought that was a a fun, solid idea that guess what we're going to do today? Guess what we're going to do? We're going to start with day one. I'm going to break it up into Friday and Saturday. So this week's show will be Breeders' Cup Friday. Next week's show will be Breeders' Cup Saturday. The logic of the plays and what they were, we can take a look at some charts. And I have all the tickets from the manual machines at Keeneland because I was unable to play online because of the state that I live in, which again, stupid, stupid horse racing nonsense, BS rules, but whatever. Um, So we're going to go through. I'll give you what my thought was for all these bets. And then we're back into the NFL. Breeders' Cup is behind us, as far as the handicapping is concerned. Um, So let's get back to handicapping some football. Go through, give you projections for all the games coming up next weekend, and I have four plays that I'm looking to be making. Uh, Three of them immediately. One of them will wait and see how things shake down on Monday night. But that's going to be the plan for episode 139 of the show. We'll go through Breeders' Cup Friday, what the plays were for the BCBC, and we'll transition into some handicapping ahead, some football for next week. So let's get into it. The Breeders' Cup betting challenge begins with a bit of a story. Um, If you're unfamiliar with all the rules, you can find them over on breederscup.com. Go into the BCBC section and you'll see the minimums and and all that sort of stuff that you need to hit. But Friday was a day that I was more or less, my goal was to just survive, get through it, have something to play with on Saturday, and press up the opinions that I had. Okay. The other thing that needs to be noted and I, it has taken a little bit of time for me to look back and be like, all right, well, that didn't help your cause Friday or Saturday. And by no means is it an excuse for the poor performance. But there were two horses that I really planned on betting relatively heavily. I had three more or less circled for the weekend. Annapolis, who we'll talk about on next week's show. G. Laurie, who I was going to bet in the juvenile Phillies turf. And Laurel River. 
Laurel River was on Saturday in the Dirt Mile. He scratches. G. Laurie was in the Juvenile Phillies turf on Friday. She scratches. So now two of the three that I had more or less built my plays or my plan around, gone. All right, well, now we just need to... Look, everyone has to deal with scratches. Now you got to adapt on the fly and figure out, okay, well, there was a large portion of the play that's gone. Now what are we going to do? So we start here, and I don't even know how well this will pick up. Keeneland, race number four on Friday. Okay, you see a number of daily doubles into the two in the fifth race. The logic behind this... $20 double, $40 double, $60 double, $40 double, $40 double, $40 double, $200 all in. This was not going to hit a minimum, but I tried to dutch these five horses into a horse that I was hopeful was going to be a decent enough price. Okay, and we'll get into the details of that horse momentarily. And as you can see, comes in 2910 in race number four. So... And really, it was one of the better case scenarios for me. Giant Mischief winning at 6-1 to one compared to Arabian Lion, who I also had covered in here. So, Giant Mischief wins. We're alive in the double to the next race. Now, the next race is the Mile and 5 eighths Marathon. Okay? So, we're alive to the two in doubles. But then I also went and looked, and the horse, keeping in mind... I need to put my plays in early enough that I can get back to the set where the touch screen, where me and Kornacki were, and have time to then hear where we're at in the show and talk to anybody if I got any kind of issues or whatever, and then do my segment and then move on. So I'm putting these things in many, many minutes in advance. Probably, I think the, er the latest I put a bet in, I think, I had one that I did after one of my hits, but for the most part, they were all in in like that 15 to 20 minutes to post range. Then then you just kind of, you know, you have a you can at least project based on probable doubles what the odds of some of these horses are going to be. Um, and that's what the dutching philosophy or theory was for that situation. But I quickly realized that the horse that I liked in the fifth race, the number two, was not going to be the price that I really wanted him to be. So I bet another 100 to win on him just for... Just for ha-has. But here's where the story starts, okay? Next, running in the mile and five-eighths race. I didn't realize this until a day or two before that this was going to be the first race as part of our broadcast window on Friday. So I only had looked at the Breeders' Cup races. And typically, I know this may sound silly to some of the diehard gamblers or any of the contest players, but for the BCBC, I typically only look at the Breeders' Cup races for two reasons. One, because I think they are the better quality races. And two, more importantly, because I have to know about all 14 of the races, both from the content we do on Thursday and leading in through Friday and Saturday, the actual show, and all the stuff leading in within the money with anybody else that I'm chatting about these races with. So typically, I don't look at any of the other races. I'll watch them, see how they play out on the track, but I don't really handicap them for the most part. But I found out this was going to be in our window. So... I go through the race and I'm looking at it and look, long distance races, my favorite, prefer them on turf, but dirt. Okay. Interesting. Let me take a look. So I'm going through and I see rattle and roll is going to be probably the favorite. And I'm like, all right, well, a bit of an odd move to go from the mile and an eighth victory in the Oklahoma Derby to this spot. I figured they would have just put him away until something like the Clark. Maybe it was a means to an end, but whatever he stacks up going through okay this next horse whatever and i keep going through and you see all the names right haywood's beach i figured he would take some money and i went back to next and i go he won by almost more than 18 lengths and that was his first time ever going long i know it was on a wet track in the cape henlopen down at delaware he probably didn't beat much but all right well let me look at it a little bit more the 90 buyers a little light but i like that he's got a little bit of early foot i've talked about this from a tactical idea that these long distance races are won i talk about the belmont every year on or pushing the early lead is where you need to be. Horses do not rally in these mile and a half or longer races. They just don't on dirt. So I know he's going to be in a decent enough position. And I pulled up the chart. And the chart was sort of an alarming piece for me because the 90 buyer that he earned, winning by the length of the stretch. And by the way, the tape is spectacular. I know we can pull it up here, but there's already enough going on with the screens. 
I pull up the chart and I see that horses coming out of the Cape Henlopen, knowing that this was an off-the-turf race, they had all improved their buyer dramatically next out. And the majority of them, I say majority, it was only a five-horse field. I think three of them did it on dirt, not on turf. I'm looking at that. I'm like, all right, well, if everybody moved up their buyer in a big, big way, and this horse earned a 90, and he won by the length of the stretch in his first time going long on dirt. Yeah, it was on a wet track, but I got to look at this a little bit more. So there is someone who is in the know with the figs who I bring this horse up to on Friday morning. And I go, what do you, what do you think about this? We look at him. We're like, all right, show some other people. And then I hear that perhaps the number is considerably lower than it should be. So, all right, well, let me take a look at it some more. I said, I mean, boy, just based on sort of the projection, I would think that 90 has got to be at least 100, maybe even more. So maybe it's, you know, revisionist history, but I make the bets that I make and I probably should have just pressed up on him because I thought I had a bit of a diamond in the rough sort of thing. And clearly I wasn't alone because the horse went off at five to one from the 15 to one morning line. He went off as the third choice or co-third choice. Wins by six, never ever is a loser. But I think the interesting thing is you pull up the chart for that Cape Henlopen now. It's not updated in those past performances we just looked at, but next earned a 100 in the Cape Henlopen, moving up 10 points from the 90 that he earned going into the Breeders' Cup. And again, you can see that these other horses, they've had their numbers change rather dramatically compared to what they had been to be more in line with what they then went on to do in their next start and next earned a 105 winning this race here. So that's part of the reason I always talk about going through and having multiple figs, being able to check different things out because time form had, er, had given him a 119, not factoring in the pace. You take 20 away from that, you get to a 99, which is one off of the 100 that he now technically has as opposed to the 90 in this K Penlipin. But long-winded way of saying we got off to a good start. And I said it on Friday afterward, back at the truck, I said, you know, I, I probably should have pressed up harder i know he was only five to one but i probably should have pressed harder knowing that i think i thought the fig was wrong and it was fairly well off and he was going to have the right running style in the whole nine i didn't i think that brought me up to like eighty seven hundred dollars or eighty nine hundred dollars <laughs> which unfortunately was a high water mark for the weekend uh but it is what it is so now we move on to race number six now this is the juvenile turf sprint and these are the bets that I made for the Juvenile Turf Sprint. Okay. $25 doubles, 6 and 12 into the 8 in the next race. 300 to win on the 6, 250 to win on the 12. I mentioned this in the broadcast. So my pick in the race was the 6 Persian Force. But I thought that the Platinum Queen was a price that she shouldn't have been. And this is a betting contest, not a picks contest. So I chose to chop up a little bit of what I was going to do, play both horses to win and have both of them in doubles into the horse I liked in the next race. Um, unfortunately, and I, I'm watching the race, and you can take a look at the chart even. I just, I, I found it odd. I was watching the race with Steve Kornacki, and I said, I, boy, Frankie moved pretty early, didn't he? And he's out in the clear now, and they're going fast, especially when you take a look and see, you know, Tyler's tribe we know unfortunately was was injured. Uh, Speedboat Beach was forward. He ended up falling back. American Apple was forward, fell back. I mean, the next nearest is Persian Force, and he's not embarrassed. He's only beaten by about three and change. I think he moved a little bit early. Would it have made the difference? Probably not. But it was something I noted. I was like, wow, man, all right, not not ideal. Clearly, the Platinum Queen, she was close, and she packed it in as well. So those doubles are no good. The win bets are no good. Six hundred dollars. My first minimum of the contest is out of the way. Don't have to worry about it. But now that means that the horse that I wanted to be alive to in daily doubles, I'm not. So this gets us to the first real audible of Friday for me. Okay. The idea going in was I was going to bet roughly somewhere in the vicinity of $1,000 to win on G. Laurie in the juvenile Phillies turf. 
now, which would have made this race one that I wasn't totally locked in on how I was going to bet it, but I knew I was going to bet atomically, assuming I got the price that I wanted. And I believe I don't have it here. I don't think maybe I do have it here still make things even better. I do. Do I? I had atomically priced out at, hopefully this works, four to one. You can see in that upper left-hand corner there. So I had made her four to one. And I saw, based on the doubles, that she was going to go off, you know, north of that number. So I went ahead and I bet $1,000 to win anatomically. I also played $10 trifectas. My, my logic was to play the race to completely fall apart. Because I thought there was a fair bit of speed in here. I thought atomically would be sitting sort of in that second flight, not too close to the front. Maybe she'd get first run on the deep closers and we'd be okay. So I played atomically along with, let me remember off the top of my head, obviously I can just look at the chart here. Um, and Tell Me No Lies, Chocolate Gelato, and Chop Chop. And I keyed her throughout. $10 tries atomically with those three over those three. Those three over atomically over those three. Those three over those three over atomically. All in, this was $1,100, $1,180. Okay, so another minimum is out of the way. And just purely in the way that the race I thought would unfold on paper, I thought I I, I liked it. I thought it was a, a pretty solid play. Atomically ends up closer to the pace. And, and to be fair, I think my my logic was correct. The race did fall apart. Aside from leave me leave no trace, the, the race fell apart. So I was right about that. I just had the wrong horses, unfortunately for me. Wonder Wheel. I, never in a million years would I have anticipated that trip for her. I thought she would be up on the lead or close to it. Part of the meltdown. Instead, she rallies. She gets the ride of the weekend from Tyler. Leave no trace. Probably runs the best race, all things considered. Hangs on. Uh, Raging Sea. The post. Combined with the trip, I just didn't see her doing what she did, and she did. And Sober Tough was a horse that I wasn't going to have, but we weren't playing supers anyway. But she rallied from last. So Atomically is a little bit close to the pace, and you can see as they're turning for home. I'm trying to get her to change leads, but realistically in my head, I'm saying it's not going to make a difference. They, they've gone too fast. She's too close to it. She's flattening out. So now the tries are out. By the way, and tell me no, no lies. She's closer than I thought she would be. I thought she'd be rallying from the, the back. Chocolate Gelato was too close to the pace. She packed it in. And Chop Chop, who was far enough back, to be fair, I haven't gone back and watched it, but she just never kicked. So wrong, right idea, wrong opinions in the race. We've now lost $1,180 on this race. This is on the heels of losing 600 in the race before. So we have all but wiped out our gains from the marathon race which is fine because in my head if i could have gotten out of friday with at least five thousand dollars i was gonna feel good going into saturday because i had opinions and we're gonna hit them accordingly but you you do i believe anyway and i think the contest itself is kind of showing that out as years and years go on that you can't win it on friday but you can lose it and I just wanted to have myself in a position where I had a puncher's chance going into Saturday. I didn't love, love anything on Friday other than next, which again, in hindsight, that was probably my biggest mistake of the weekend. Not the shitty opinions, was just not absolutely pounding that horse at five to one. So we move on to race eight, the juvenile Phillies turf. This became a race that once G. Lori was withdrawn, um, I had no opinion. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to bother making any kind of plays in here. Because I would just be guessing. I thought it was a bit of a chaos race. In fact, it was not a chaos race. Uh, Meditate was spectacular. Uh, PTF was all over her. He had gotten down on her when he was over there. Um, I believe it like seven or eight to one. I mean, she was fabulous in that spot. I liked Pleasant Passage. I liked Free Look. I liked the two horses coming out of the aqueduct race. Um, 
I audibled my pick to Kijera, thinking that they were going to use her early to make sure she wasn't hung wide because she's a speed horse. And I, did she miss the break? She brushed the gate. She went wide, never a factor. And there's the, is the short comment. I, I mean, I was stunned when I came back around the corner and I looked and I said, how the, how is she so far back? She's supposed, A, because you're a hundred wide, no matter what. But I'd rather not be wide at the back of the pack. If I'm going to be wide, at least be forward. She was neither, but I didn't make a bet on the race. So it didn't really bother me that much. And this is one of those weekends where as much as I care about the picks that I give out, I'm more concerned about the bets. And I knew the price that I had made Kijera for the longest time. She was actually less than that 691. She was, I want to say in like the nine to two, five to one range. I said, she's an underlay. I'm not going to be betting her. Sit it out. Don't do anything. So I didn't bet. Great. We move on. Gets us to the juvenile. Now, the juvenile was a funny race to, to play out for me because I didn't, I was playing the juvenile turf, the last race of the day for chaos. And in this race, my thought was cave rock is too much. They're not gonna be able to beat him. If it's not him, maybe it's the other Baffert national treasure. So I'm texting during the show with, um, he is, he's a great handicapper, but he's also, he works for NBC Sports as a researcher, John Furlong. And John and I are going back and forth. And I told him I'm betting doubles into a bomb in the finale. And I'm only going to bet the Baffert horses. And it's probably going to be somewhere around a, a, like a $480 double cave rock into this horse and then $120 double into the other one. And then I sat there, I'm looking at it and I go, you know, you know what'll really chat my ass is if is if Forte ends up winning this race because on paper he's fast enough, he's proven at Keeneland, and if for whatever reason this pace scenario gets a little bit hot and he comes rolling, and I don't have him into this horse in the next race, I'm gonna feel like a real heel. So I add Forte. Sure enough, Forte goes and wins it five to one. I immediately send for along the eyeball emoji. So now I have a $110 double of Forte into Reckoning Force, who was 50 to 1. Now, I'm and I picked him. I played this race for Chaos. In hindsight, clearly, the only thing you need to do is take the Europeans. What else is new? Overthinking it, trying to get cute. Uh, but I, I did. I, the, the logic for Re Reckoning Force was... If you liked, now here's the other caveat. You needed to like him or think he was appealing going into the bourbon because he was four to one in the bourbon, just barely behind and the winner is, okay? And he had a miserable trip. You can see my trip note, da -da, you know, the whole nine, da -da, da 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 Prior to that, his run at Kentucky Downs, I didn't think it was bad. And he had run well enough against a couple of decent horses up in Saratoga. So I didn't think he was overly matched or, you know, overmatched, I should say, in terms of the American hopes. Added blinkers. That didn't bother me either. From, and because he goes out for a good trainer in Brendan Walsh. Big things. I, I just didn't think he was... I thought his price was going to be much higher than it should have been. Not that he was a likely winner. And this double here... Again, $110 double Forte into Reckoning Force. I believe the number was somewhere around $27,000 it would have come back. And no, it did not happen. He finished 13th in the field of 14. But my the thought behind it, and I, I still believe this to an extent. I think events like this... Oh, and by the way, I also did this. This was a $5 trifecta of silver knot and reckoning force with silver knot and reckoning force with the entire field and i ran that all the way through so 411 411 all 411 all 411 all 411 411 that came back those are each five dollar trifectas totals 360 bucks the logic was silver knot i expected to run well and if reckoning force could just hit the board even if he didn't win and i didn't have that twenty seven thousand dollar double it's going to be massive. He's 50 to one. If he hits the board, even with silver knot, 
we're going to get paid. And in fact, really, if you want to use this sort of formula, Victoria Road at five over Silver Knot over uh, Nagarok, just think of Nagarok as reckoning force. I know it's not that simple, but ballpark. You know, is it going to be a groundbreaker? No, but for a dollar, it was coming back, what, 340? Call it 350, got it that five times. You know, you're going to get something out of it. You just pad your bankroll. It wasn't one that we were going to hit a home run with if you ran third with chalks in there, but it was not an impossible, you know, an impossible scenario. At least that was the way I looked at it. And no, he didn't run. But going back to this, the, the overall idea behind it was I wanted to be in positions both Friday and Saturday to make scores. I didn't think slowly building the bank or betting more on higher probability chances was the right play. And now, again, with a week plus to look back and, and to reflect on it, I think that's part of my logic being incorrect in ter- purely in terms of this contest. My day-to-day, I still believe that sort of thing. Um, but I, I think you, I think there's an element of needing to be more flexible and not so stringent on, oh, this horse is an overlay. This, and you only have X amount of opportunity in a contest like this. So you need to get, I think you need to bend a little bit more. Um, and I, I did not do that and because it didn't really even register with me, but this is one play that I absolutely, I would make it again. Because if he hits the board as part of that try, we're going to, at the very least, get our money back and pad the bankroll to Saturday. And that's assuming he just rounds out the try. If he runs first or second, it's boxcars. And if he wins, forget about the try. We've got, we got almost 30 grand coming back, and we're in great shape going into Saturday. So those were the Friday plays. And all told, I had, I think, 6,000, 6,100, some, somewhere thereabouts going into Saturday. Which, again, going in, my logic was get me to 5,000 Saturday and I feel good. So, in a way, I felt like I was ahead. That's when I started thinking after the day, went back, we've got production meetings, starting to think a little bit more about, all right, well, maybe I'm going to look back and regret not really pressing up on next. Because we all got back to the truck and I was talking to some folks. We all were like, the with a little bit of, of research and a little bit of homework. And again, I am not suggesting this is some sort of a, you know, brilliant groundbreaking opinion because the horse is bet down to five to one. But that's an example of all those times that I've, I've mentioned going through and doing your own work, not just relying on the number being the number. If you got different figs and they don't jive, do a little bit of research because you can uncover a gem like that. I just didn't press it up nearly as hard as I should have. Easy to say now with the way everything played out, um, but I, I should have, at the very least, I think it, it should have been a replacement possibly for the 1,000 to win on atomically. Maybe this bet should have been 600 with the 1,000 going to next, and all of a sudden you know, you're going into these other races at, you know, call it 12,000 as opposed to, to 8,900. Uh, but it's easy to say with hindsight. So those were Friday's plays. We're going to come back next week and we'll go into Saturday's plays, lay out the logic. Um, let me know what you think of my plans, the way I laid it all out uh, beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. These bets are all in the past. Let's talk about some bets in the future. The NFL. We are, what, halfway through the season already? Something like that? Um, Still really don't know which teams are good or bad, uh, but my model has opinions, and I'm quite confident with those opinions. So let's take a look at next week's slate of games, and we'll give you a few bets to consider in the National Football League. We've been gone for a while in terms of the NFL projections, but in the midst of Breeders' Cup season and getting all the horses straightened out, um, it needed to take a bit of a back seat. But here we are. We're back better than ever. The only thing I'll do differently this time around is I'm not going to give the individual player projections. I have them in my model, but we're just going to go through game by game, give you my projected final score of the game, 
uh, and then compare and contrast to what the book is offering. These odds are from DraftKings as of 11.15 Monday morning, somewhere thereabouts. Um, so by the time you listen to this, if you are inclined to play or you're looking at a different sports book, these numbers could change. Uh, there's still the Monday night game to come, which could affect one of the plays, and that's how we'll kind of wrap things up. There are four games that I'm planning on playing for next weekend. One of them I may wait until Tuesday, but that could end up being a bit of a, a negative because I could see that number going up. We'll get there in time, but let's get right down to it. The projections compared to the book numbers, um, and as always, let me know if you agree, disagree, you like a certain play, you like a certain team, uh, whether it's totals, whether it's, you know, sides, whatever it may be, beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter, at Bernier underscore Matt. Let's start on Thursday with the Titans and the Packers. The Packers are two and a half point home favorites. Uh, I have the game projected as Green Bay winning 21.4 to 20.7. And clearly, I understand, you know, some folks will hear that and say, what, why are you giving me fractional points? Um, I mean, you can round for yourself, call it 21 to 21. I think there is a little bit of it's just a, a finer point on emphasizing just the difference between the two. Because if you rounded that, it would effectively be calling it um, a pick'em. But based on the fractional pieces, I'm inclined to look at it more as Green Bay minus one. Um, the total is 41. My projection adds up to 42.1. I'm not going to make a play on the game. I don't like the short week games. We've seen time and time again this year that the Thursday night games, regardless of your opinion of either side, are complete shit shows. So it's just a game that I'm inclined to say, let's sit back and watch. Maybe you play some DFS, uh, or maybe you don't even do that. I will say, I've been playing more of the um, the Sunday night, Monday night, Thursday night DFS games where you have to have like the captain, and I'm sure FanDuel does it differently or any of these other ones, but I've been playing on DraftKings. Um, it's, there is, you need to have the players that score, that's stating the obvious, but compared to sort of your standard sa uh, Sunday DFS slate for the one and four o'clock games, you don't need to you don't need to try and reinvent the wheel. I know a lot of these guys have got major exposure and you're looking for separators and things like that, but I think the the captain play with the one and a half times A the, the cost, but also the reward as far as the points scored are concerned. I just think it's a fun little wrinkle. So maybe that's where I'll end up going on Thursday night with that Titans and Packers game. All things considered, wrap it up. No play for me there. Uh, Sunday, Jets at Pats. The Patriots are three and a half point home favorites. I have them favored by 3.3 points. Winning the game 21.4 to 18.1. Uh, the total at the book is 38 and a half. I have it at 39 and a half. The margins are too small. This Patriots team, <laughs> I love them, but, you know, haven't been wowed by them. So, and I think the Jets are good. Many people have laid out the defense. Um, Zach Wilson certainly has his shortcomings, but... I think they're a solid enough team, as I think the Patriots are. Uh, it's a game that I don't see any real edge one way or the other. One point, as far as an over-under is concerned, isn't something that's going to really you know, lead me to go ahead and make a play. Um, you will hear, when I go through, my numbers have the actual percentages, the likelihood of certain teams covering X amount of points or a total going over or under X amount of the time. Uh, so we'll get into that, but it's an inexact piece for me to try to explain why I'll certainly look at one number versus another and why one point difference in the total for that Jets and Pats game is not enough for me to make a move on. Uh, there is some, there's a method to the madness and we'll, we'll get into that when we get some plays going, but it's a pass for me, but I've got the Pats winning 21.4 to 18.1. Uh, the Browns and Bills, this is an interesting game. Uh, the book right now, the Bills are nine and a half point favorites. Uh, at home. The total is 47. I have Buffalo winning 30.2 to 18.3. Now that's a 12 point, roughly 12 point differential um, in favor of Buffalo. So now normally this would be a game that I would be inclined to say, give me Buffalo minus nine and a half. Uh, my total adds up to 48 and a half. I suppose you could look to the over, but the reason I'm not going to be making a play in the game is, and I know we're still roughly a week away, has nothing to do with Josh, Josh Allen's elbow. It has everything to do with the weather. Now, I know sometimes this gets a little bit overblown, but any time, as more and more time has gone by with sports in general, but especially the NFL, because I think football just in, inherently is a bit of a more, I think the difference between the best and the worst 
is so small, especially compared to some other sports, professional sports, where I think the difference between the best and the worst is considerably greater, more dramatic. Uh, Weather.com says three to five inches of snow and winds 15 to 25 miles an hour on Sunday in Buffalo. It's enough for me, an added variable, to say, look, I don't need to make a play on this game. They can certainly win. They can certainly cover the number. But with that added layer to things, I there are other games that I think are playable. And will I be disappointed if Buffalo covers the 9.5? No. I just say, look, no harm, no foul. Nothing gained, nothing lost. We move on to the next. But if you are absolutely hell-bent on making a play, I do think Buffalo covers that number. And I think they do so relatively comfortably. I've been covering the 9.5 56.96% of the time. So when you compare that to odds offered of minus 110, um, you know, you're you're looking at a not necessarily a sizable overlay, but a decent enough overlay. Detroit Lions at the New York Giants. The Giants are three and a half point home favorites. Uh, the total is 46 and a half. I have the Giants winning 24.3 to 20.7. That equates to a 3.6 point difference, meaning the Giants are 3.6 point favorites on my numbers. Uh, the total is 45, which comes in a point and a half below the number right now. Another one where I like what the Giants have done. Many people have talked about it. We're not, you know, not telling you anything you don't know at this point. Uh, Brian Dayball has turned sort of the, the cultural aspect around. But the Lions aren't as bad, I think, as their record would suggest. And I'm not just saying that because of the win yesterday against the Bears. I don't think the Bears are all that good. But D Detroit has been in many of these games. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if this is a little bit of a gross one back and forth. Neither team... Detroit is a good offense, but their defense is wretched. Um, all around, it's just a game that I don't see enough of an edge to be making a play on, so it's a pass. But I do have the Giants winning 24.3 to 20.7. Bears at the Falcons. Just talked about the Bears. Uh, the Falcons are three-point favorites. I was a little bit surprised to see this, and then when I ran the numbers, um, it more or less checks out on my stuff. The total is 49. I have the Falcons winning 25.6 to 22.5. That is a 3.1 point difference compared to the three that is offered at the book right now. The total is 48.1. I don't see enough of a difference there. The Bears thing, I think, is smoke and mirrors. The, Justin Fields is fantastic, but he does not throw the ball particularly well. He hasn't. And I know some folks are saying that that offense is, you know, getting better, and it is. I mean, they're putting more points up, but it it is purely based on his legs. He's not beating people through the air. And yeah, you can keep others honest. And maybe you have, you know, someone who ends up acting as a spy. And now you've got one less guy to drop back into coverage. But to me, he's just a, a much worse version. And I know it's, he's young. He's only in his second year. But he's a much worse version of Lamar Jackson. Um, you know, I, I, it's easy to say that. I, I just, I, I'm not a believer right now. I just don't see it. Lamar, to me, was always, he could always throw the ball, despite what many people had laid out saying, oh, maybe he's not the best passer. I, Lamar could always throw the ball and beat you purely throwing the ball. I firmly believe that. But then you added in his legs, and that was what made him the MVP that he was a few years ago, and I think he still has an outside chance to win it this year. We'll get to the Baltimore game in a minute. Fields, maybe he'll turn into that. And yeah, he's got a little bit more help now that they've got Claypool outside to go along with Mooney. Cole Komet, he got hurt in the middle of the second half yesterday. I don't know how significant that was, but I just, I, I got to see him do it a little bit more through the air than I have to this point. I will say I was a little bit surprised that my numbers spit out 3.1 for the difference with the Falcons being favored by 3.1 because I think the Falcons suck. I, I, I just don't think they're very good. And that's another thing that I've come to realize and lean more and more into in all sports just stay away from games where teams are shit i mean the bears and falcons neither team is is good why do i really need to be betting on that i only want to bet on teams that i know are quality that i know have upside that i know have potential and yes both of these teams have potential don't misconstrue what i mean by potential they're they're neither of them are gonna make the playoffs at least i don't think i'd be stunned um so, you know, again, from a fantasy standpoint, probably a great game to play. But I'd have no interest in laying any real money on that spot. 
Panthers and Ravens. Ravens are at home. They are 11 and a half point home favorites. Um, the total is 44. I have the Ravens winning 29 to 16.6. There's a 12.4 point differential that would cover the 11 and a half. I have them covering 53.7% of the time. The total is 45.7. Again, it, it's such a, a slight edge compared to the minus 110 price that I don't feel compelled to make a play. Uh, I would lean Ravens minus 11 and a half. I think there's a chance that Baltimore ends up being, and I thought this at the beginning of the season, and I know they've kind of done one of these. I think there's a chance that Baltimore might be the best team in the AFC. I still believe Buffalo is probably number one, even with Allen a little bit dinged up and them losing a couple in a row. But I think Baltimore, you know, the Roquan Smith move on defense, I think helped bolster an area of concern. But they've been so good in so many of these games. And you go and look at that record, it's been well documented that they've coughed up these fourth quarter leads throughout the season against many of the best teams. Could that be a fatal flaw? Absolutely. But they're at least in position to do it. They're not one of these teams that's trying to rally from down some giant deficit. They've won at home. They've won on the road. They've beaten good teams. They've been ahead of almost every team. I think Baltimore is legitimate. I, to me, they're arguably the most dangerous, especially if they can get healthy. They've got enough Swiss Army knife kind of running backs to go along with Lamar. I know you're without Bateman now for the rest of the season. Andrews is still dinged up, but Isaiah likely has come on. Um, I just, I think there's enough with Baltimore, and I believe in. I like Harbaugh. I think he's a good coach. Um, I I think Baltimore is legitimate. I won't bet them at eleven and a half. It, it's a lean. I think they cover it, but I I just don't think there's enough of a uh, an edge there to really make a play. I do like Baltimore long term though. Philly and Indianapolis in Indy. This is a game that, again, the Eagles play on Monday night, recording this, you know, late morning on Monday. The book has Philly favored by nine on the road. The total's 44 and a half. I have Philadelphia winning 28.1 to 15, which is a 13.1 point differential. Compared to the number right now, it is a 4.1 difference, which to me... There is enough there to play. I have the total adding up to 43.1. I won't be playing the under, especially with a team like Philly that can put up points the way that they do. But the, the tough thing here is this is all assuming the Eagles go into next Sunday's game fully healthy. They're playing on a short week, which is no bargain. But Indianapolis, despite the fact that they beat the Raiders Sunday with Saturday as their coach, with Matt Ryan getting back in. I mean, the team is still no good. Jonathan Taylor put it back together finally for the first time really all season, which is, I guess, a positive. But the reason I'm, I'm going to probably wait, and it could end up being a, a the downfall for me, is that if Jalen Hurts, for whatever reason, gets hurt Monday night, hope it doesn't happen, but if it does, that number is not nine. It probably comes down a couple ticks. And do I have enough faith in Gardner Minshew to cover an, on the road, a big number on the road? I, I, again, I don't need to get involved in that if I don't have to. So while right now everything looks great, I could easily see that number moving to 10 if they win tonight, the way that they probably should. And maybe this percentage that I have comes down a bit for them covering the number. It certainly would come down. But I have them covering nine points on the road 61.18% of the time. That is one of the four plays that if that number is still there on Tuesday, and even if it moves up a little bit, there's enough wiggle room. I probably won't bet as much, but if it goes to nine and a half or 10, there's still enough of an edge there in my eyes that it'll probably end up being a play. So for me right now, Philadelphia on the road, I know it's a big number, especially for a road team in the NFL, but I would lay the nine right there with the Eagles on Sunday in Indy. The Rams and the Saints. Uh, just a couple of just complete shit bum teams. Uh, the Saints are three-point home favorites. The total is 39.5. I have them winning 19.3 to 15.8. This number does not make a difference whether it's Matt Stafford or the other fella, Wofford, whatever his name was. Um, I, I think the, the difference is negligible. I, I just don't think they're a very good team right now, the Rams. And the Saints have proven that they are nothing special. 
Um, so the number right now is three. The total is 39 and a half. I have a three and a half point difference. But more importantly, my total is 35.1, which comes in well under the 39 and a half. This is another play for me on Sunday, under 39 and a half. I have that coming in 58.56% of the time, under 39 and a half in the Rams Saints game. Uh, commanders and Texans in Houston. Again, the Commanders play on Monday night against the Eagles, so maybe this number changes a little bit, but the Commanders are two and a half point road favorites. The total is 40 and a half. I have Washington winning 20.1 to 18.2. That's a 1.9 point difference. So maybe there is a slight edge in taking Houston plus the points at home. I just am not all that interested in doing that. Again, the total at 40 and a half. My number is 38.4. Suppose you could look to the under in that spot. I have it coming in 55.6% of the time, but there's just not enough of an edge there for me to really get excited about. Uh, there is enough of an edge in this game coming up, though. The Raiders and the Broncos. Broncos are three-point home favorites. The total is 41.5. I have Denver winning 19.7 to 16.2 against Vegas. That's a three-and-a-half point difference, so there's we're not playing sides here, but the total coming in at 35.9 compared to the 41.5. I have it coming under... 41.5, 64.7% of the time. That is absolutely going to be a play for me. Probably one of the bigger ones of the weekend of these plays that I'm laying out for you. Um, just neither team's very good. They're just not. I thought the Raiders would be good. I thought Denver would be good. And they both are largely mediocre. Um, if I had faith in the Broncos being able to run the ball a little bit more than they have, I don't believe in Melvin Gordon. I just don't. Josh Jacobs has had a great season, but the Raiders as a whole just seem to be kind of floundering right now. Um, I I, have, I see no reason why you should be terrified of, even if it does go over, I don't think it's, it's not going to be a shootout. Um, I, under 41 and a half is the play for me there. Cowboys and Vikings is an interesting number. The Cowboys are one and a half point road favorites uh, after losing on the road in Green Bay yesterday in overtime. And the Vikings are home and they're catching a point and a half after beating the Bills on the road. The total's 47 and a half. I have Minnesota winning 24.4 to 23.9. So it's only a half point difference between the two, but I think the Vikings should be favored. The problem is, again, the margins are so small that I won't be making a play on it. The Vikings' money line is only plus 100. It just doesn't do anything for me for a coin flip of a kind of game. And as I talked about at the top, I think the margins in this league are so small that I don't need to just gamble on a coin flip. I'm going to pass in the game. I think it should be an entertaining one. I have the total coming in at 48.4, which is over the 47.5, but uh, there will be no play for me acknowledging that I do think the Vikings should be favored, not the Cowboys. Here's the big play of the weekend, and this could be a bit of a sucker number, but I'm just going based on the, the projections. I know it's a divisional battle, and I know the Steelers won earlier this year against the Bengals, and now they're home. But the Bengals at the Steelers, the Bengals are five-point road favorites. The total's 41.5. I have Cincinnati winning 25.9 to 15.9. So think of it as 26-16, basically. Uh, that's a 10-point difference. I have the total at 41.7. So those, my total and the book total is spot on. I just have a massive discrepancy in who should be, how heavily favored. Um I think the Bengals are solid. I was very dubious early in the season. They looked so disjointed and a complete mess. And they burned me a couple nights ago or a couple weeks ago, I should say, um, on Halloween, on Monday night against the Browns. So, you know, is this an eerily similar situation? I suppose you could say that. But I, I just think the Bengals are a far better team than the Steelers are. Um, I have them covering the five sixty six point five percent of the time. So that's going to be probably the heaviest play of the weekend. Um, I just, and I know divisional battles this time of year, yada, yada, yada. It, and the numbers in kind of that smelly territory that, you know, four to five and a half kind of range. I, I'm going with the numbers. Maybe this is a bit of a, a, a square play, which I think is such a stupid, you know, the sharps do this, the squares, it's, you know, whatever. Well, who, who gives a shit what you call what? Do you, what, what do you think? What's your opinion? In my case, what do my numbers say? My numbers say the Bengals should be 10-point favorites on the road. That's factoring in the home field advantage, which I have at like 2.1 overall. Um, Bengals, minus five. Big play for me. Chiefs at Chargers. 
that was flexed to Sunday night. I think it's going to be a great game. Um, and I have the numbers almost identical to what the book does. The book has the Chiefs as six and a half point road favorites. The total is 50. I have Kansas City winning 27 and a half to 21, which is six and a half point difference. The total at 48.6. It's one that I'll be p- playing that DFS Sunday night game, but I will not be betting on. And then Monday night, there's a, a slight sort of element of unknown about who the quarterback will be for the Cardinals. San Francisco on the road in Arizona. The number right now, San Fran is a seven and a half point road favorite. The total's 44. The The interesting thing for me is I don't see much of a difference whether it's Kyler Murray or Colt McCoy. I don't think Arizona is very good. Um, and I think McCoy is serviceable enough and Kyler has shown enough inconsistencies and just flat out bitchiness that I, I don't think there's a mu- much of a difference. If I'm actually quantifying it, I have a 0.2 point difference with Kyler being the quarterback versus Colt McCoy with, you know, the Cardinals effectively, think of it this way, the 49ers would be giving up 0.2 points more with Kyler in than they would be with Colt McCoy. Um, 23.2 to 17.1. I mean, we're we're not talking about anything major difference there. Uh, The spread is 6.2 compared to the 7.5. I guess you could play the Cardinals at home catching more than a touchdown i'd make sure you get it through that seven don't let it get any shorter than that if you're going to do it but uh in the total of 40.4 compared to 44 yeah you could lean to the under um but i I just san francisco i think is good but i'm not wowed by what they've done lately and arizona arizona feels like that backdoor cover kind of team all the time and garbage time points if they get down double digits going into the second half or even if they're more than that, let's say, it'll certainly be doubles. But point being, if they're down 14 or they're down 17 or even more, I could see them picking up some some ship time points and all of a sudden that number goes up and, and we, you know, unfortunately lose that under because of nonsense time. So it, it's a game I'll probably avoid all things considered. And who knows, maybe on this show next week we'll go back and relook um, and, and something will come about. We'll know who the quarterback will be, I would assume, by then. Um, and maybe there'll be a change, but all things considered, that game's going to be a pass for me. So the four plays that I'm going to be making, one of them is contingent on what the number looks like come Tuesday. Uh, Eagles at Colts, Eagles minus nine at 110, at minus 110. I have that coming in 61.18% of the time. Rams at the Saints, under 39 and a half at minus 110. That's 58.56% of the time coming under the number. The Raiders at the Broncos, under 41 and a half at minus 110. I have that coming in 64.7% of the time. And last, and certainly not least, the big one for me, the Bengals at the Steelers. I have Cincinnati minus five at minus 110, coming in 66.5% of the time. There you have it. We will revisit this again next week. You can find all my plays over on Twitter at Bernie or underscore Matt. I'm keeping track of everything in the bio as well. You can find NHL, Premier League, which we won't see any change for quite some time now because we've got the world cup break uh nba plays the college basketball model is being put together it's way too early to be drawing any kind of conclusions but i'll be getting into that as we get a little bit more data because many of these teams have played two to three games so we're certainly not making any draws or any projections from those numbers but it's coming along picking things up again you can find all those in the official plays that i put out there over on twitter at bernie or underscore Matt, that's going to do it for episode 139 of the show. However you listen, thank you for doing so. Many ways to find the pod, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and themoneypodcast.com. You can watch and listen along over on YouTube as well. Search bar Matt Burner, your show. you get this episode along with 130 prior. And until we come back on Monday, best of luck however you play, whatever you play, wherever you play. This has been episode 139 of the Matt Burner, your show.